Jack Wrocław, I'm really that glad that you all came here. Today our guest is Uncle Bob. We are really happy and excited that you agreed to our invitation and that you are here today with us. Everyone who watched this stream can win JetBrands license. To have a chance, just need to be active on the YouTube chat. After the presentation, Uncle Bob will ask, answer for some of the questions for the few minutes, and I hope you will enjoy that. Bob, stage, stage is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everybody. It's uh, it's good to be virtually attending the chug here. Uh, it's been, my goodness, I think it's been uh, 12 or 13 years since I have been to Rotslav, but when I was there, I had a very good time, ate some pierogies and had a good, uh, I think, meal of bigos and drank some of the uh, some of the local beer, uh, which was very good. Anyway, it's time for us to get into uh, expecting professionalism. This is a talk that I have done many times in many different places, uh, and it's usually uh, usually goes pretty well. So I begin this by transporting you to a world which uh, I am your new CTO. Now, this is not a good idea. I would not make a good administrator. You know, I'm a, I'm a programmer and I'm a really good lecturer, but when it comes to actually managing things, I'm not all that good at that. So, so you really don't want to be in this world where I am your new CTO. On the other hand, uh, what is it that I would expect from you? if I were your new CTO. And that's really the issue that we're going to be diving into. I'm going to give you a set of expectations. All of those expectations will have to do with professionalism. <laughs> what are we professionals? Well, what is a professional? A professional is someone who professes something. So what is it that we profess? Do we have any standards, any ethics? Do we have any disciplines that we profess as part of our profession? <laughs> and the answer to that is no, we don't. Uh, programmers in general do not have any kind of, of common sets of standards or ethics or disciplines that we as an industry profess. And this is somewhat um, disappointing and um, problematic because our uh, society depends on us in ways that it does not yet understand and even we don't understand. But I want you just to, to drive this point home. I want you to just look around. Now, I don't know where you all are. You're very likely all at home watching me on a screen. Or if you're not at home, you're in an office or something like that. But just look around. And, and to begin with, just look around on your body. How many computers do you have uh, on your body at the moment? Now, you know, I can go through myself here. and You know, I've got my phone. <laughs> you know, iPhone. How many computers do you think are in this iPhone? I, this is a lot. I don't know how many. It's a lot though, because there's one for the screen and there's the main processor and there's one for the cellular radio and there's another one for the GPS and another one for the Bluetooth and God knows how many processors there are and how much code is running in this phone <laughs> at the moment. And, and it's just gotta be, you know, tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions of lines of code. But what's really interesting about this is that there's code in the case because <laughs> the case contains a little communications protocol so that it can measure the battery and report the battery stuff. So there's programs running in the case. Now, of course, this is not the only computer that I have on my body at the moment. So in my pocket, I have my AirPods. <laughs> my AirPods. And you know, there's two AirPods in here. Each one of them has got a little computer and it at least one little computer might be two. Maybe there's an audio computer and a Bluetooth computer. I don't know what the architecture is inside these things, but you know, there's got to be a lot of software running in here. But 
Even more interesting than that is the case. The case has a processor in it too. <laughs> that's the second case that's got a processor in it. And of course, this is not the only computer that's on my body. Look at my car keys. I don't know if you can see my car keys, but there's my car keys. That's got a little computer in it. And Oh yeah, there's my watch. <laughs> Apple watch. It's got a lot of software running in that thing. Look around the room. What do you see around the room? Your room, not my room. <laughs> but I'll tell you what's on my room, right? My room, I've got a motion detector on the wall up there. Software running in that motion detector. And I've got, uh, uh, oh, there's a big screen TV over there. There's got to be software running in that big screen TV, right? And, and, oh, there's a little clock on the wall over there. It's just a regular old pendulum clock, as a matter of fact. But there's a computer in it because it's crystal controlled. And there's a little computer in there that counts the oscillations of the crystal and does the math to drive the gears. Oh, yes. And what else do we have on here? Oh, there's a Roku and an Apple TV. And, oh, yeah, there's a Nest camera. And, well, I think you get the point. There's an awful lot of software within 10 feet of me. But it doesn't stop there, does it? I mean, my house and probably your house is loaded down with software. I, you can't do anything in modern society without interacting with software somehow. You can't cook a hot dog in the microwave because the microwave is controlled by a processor. And so is your refrigerator, probably. You can't wash clothes because the washing machine is controlled by a computer. You can't dry clothes, of course. You can't use the telephone <laughs> without using a computer. You can't watch TV. There's not much you can do without using a computer. Even when I go out for a bike ride, I've got computers on that bicycle. Modern society is driven by software. Your grandmother uses software systems, if you still have a grandmother, I hope you do, uses software systems virtually every minute of every day without knowing it because there is nothing you can do in our society without interacting with a software system. You can't drive a car because that car is controlled by computers. You can't go to the store because you're probably using GPS to do it. You can't buy anything because the cash registers have software in them. You can't sell anything. You can't enforce a law. You can't make a law. You can't file an insurance claim. You can't buy insurance. There is nothing much that you can do in our society without interacting with a software system. And that puts you and I <laughs> smack in the middle of everything that society does. You and I rule the world. We don't know it yet. Other people think they rule the world and then they hand the rules to us and we write the rules that execute in the machines that govern everything. And that's a problem. Because society depends upon us now critically. If there were no programmers, society would stop. <laughs> there'd, be, there'd be no information flows because everything happens through software now. <laughs> all, all the communications, the text messages and the emails and the Zooms, this thing that you're doing, we're doing right now, it's all software. And that puts you and I square in the middle of everything. And who are you and I? A bunch of unprofessionals. <laughs> All of our society depends upon an industry that has no declared profession. We profess nothing. We have no standards. We have no ethics. We have no disciplines. Individually, of course, many of us do. <laughs> Some of us don't like the guys at Volkswagen who cheated the California EPA, but never mind that. <laughs> Many of us have our own standards and our own disciplines and our own ethics, but our industry does not profess these things. One day, sometime in the probably not too distant future, some poor software guy is going to do some dumb thing and kill 10,000 people. 
And it doesn't take much imagination to figure out what that might be. <laughs> There's just too much software out there. 10,000 people could easily die because of a missing semicolon. And when that happens, and you know it will, the politicians of the world will finally take notice. And they will point their fingers right at us. And you'd, you'd like to think they'll point it at your boss and your company. But no, they'll point it right at us because it is our fingers on the keyboard after all. And they will ask us the question. And the question is, how could you have let this happen? And we'd better have a good answer for them. Because if we don't, if our answer is, you know, my boss told me it had to be done on Tuesday. If that's our answer, then the politicians of the world will heave a great sigh of disappointment and disgust. And then they will begin to pass new laws. Laws that constrain our behavior laws that tell us what languages we can use and what platforms we can use and what frameworks we can use and what courses we have to pass and what books we have to read and what signatures we have to get. And we will all wind up working for the government, which is something I would like to avoid. <laughs> so what I'm going to do now is tell you as your new CTO what I expect from you. You are going to hear these expectations with two different ears. One ear will be the ear of the programmer, and that ear will reject everything I say. It will sound ridiculous. It will sound impossible. But the other ear that you will hear this with is the ear of the customer, the user. And to that ear, everything will make perfect sense. Let's begin. I expect, as your new CTO, that we will not ship shit. Now, that seems like a fairly reasonable expectation, doesn't it? And yet the ear of the programmer is already chattering into your brain saying, well, wait a minute, we have to ship shit sometimes. I mean, for goodness sake, how are we ever going to make a deadline if we don't ship shit? I want to stress this as much as I can. None of our managers, none of our users, none of our customers expect that we will ship shit. <laughs> now, I want you guys to just kind of sit back for a minute and count the number of times in the last few years where you have violated this expectation. <laughs> because... For some very bizarre reason, in our industry, it has become acceptable to ship code that we know is bad, <laughs> that we know is substandard, that we know has flaws, serious flaws. We have come to expect in our industry that shipping bugs is normal. Now, I don't know when this happened and I don't know why it happened. It's just that everybody now simply expects that there will be a fair number of defects. Whenever you get a new version of something, you think, man, well, it's probably not going to work very well at first, but they'll clean up the bugs later. Many of us, in fact, uh, use the the practice of not installing new software right away. You know, a new version comes out and, and you look at that and go, hmm, <laughs> I'm going to wait for about two months until the, the first couple of dot releases come out. After that, they'll probably have all the defects worked out. It's probably a symptom of something going very wrong in our industry. But let's move on. I expect that we will always be ready. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I presume, of course, that you are all doing agile because that's what we do in software now. We all do agile, right? And, and for, for most of us, that means that we're doing Scrum. <laughs> and of course, if we are doing Agile or Scrum, we are, we are working in nice, short iterations or sprints. 
In Scrum, we call them sprints. In Agile, we call them iterations, but it doesn't matter. It's the same thing. And usually those are on the order of two weeks long. Some people make them four weeks long. Some people make them three weeks long. That's too long, by the way, right? Should be two weeks. Maybe one week would be better. I like one week best. And most people do two weeks, though. Whatever, whatever. What is supposed to be done at the end of each sprint? And the answer to that is everything. Or rather, the code should be deployable at the end of each sprint. That is not to say that it will have enough features for the business to want to deploy it. But from a technical point of view, the programmers are ready to deploy at the end of each iteration, at the end of each sprint. And that's what I mean here by we will always be ready. At the end of each sprint, we will have deployable software. As I said, the business may not wish to deploy it. It may not have enough features. That's fine. It, it then becomes a business decision as to whether it will actually be deployed or not. But from our point of view, from the technical point of view, we're ready to we're ready to ship it. Ship it. Okay, you know, we've got a login. We don't have a log out yet, but that's okay. We can ship it if you want to. <laughs> and what? I'm going to turn off my text messages now because I'm getting a whole bunch of little dings from someone who actually knows that I'm giving a talk at the moment, but they're dinging me. Anyway, um, we will always be ready to ship technically, even if it's not ready business-wise. And what does it take to be ready technically? It takes... All the documentation being done, all the testing being done, all the QA being done, everything done at the end of each sprint. Now, you might be saying, well, we can't do all the QA and all the documentation and all the testing at the end of every sprint. I mean, we're going to have to delay that until seven sprints from now. In fact, we'll just do a whole sprint where we do nothing but the QA. And, and, and that, of course, is not the way Agile works. <laughs> That was not the intent, right? We did not actually want you to do waterfall while you're saying that you're doing agile. We wanted you to do agile. And if you are doing agile, then at the end of every sprint, you have finished all of the testing and all of the QA and all of the documentation for all of the features that you are delivering in that sprint. Hmm. <laughs> but onward. I expect stable productivity. Stable productivity. What does that mean? It means that I expect you to go as fast today as you went a year ago. <laughs> now, imagine that you are working on a greenfield project, right? There's no code, right? It's a brand new project. And there's five or six of you and you've got a nice little team and you're going to work together on this project. How fast can you go? There's no code, right? Someone comes to you and says, okay, we need the first feature. How soon can you get it done? And you go, oh, I think I can get it done almost instantly. And you start writing code and code pours out of every orifice of your body. Code exudes from you. And within a week, or two, everything is working. And all of your all of your managers and customers go, we've never seen anyone go so fast before. This is wonderful. Can you do it again? Here's another feature. And you go, yes. Come back to that team about a year later. <laughs> Ask them to do a feature. Ooh, that's going to be tricky. It's going to take us months. You used to do this in a week or two. Yeah, I know, but you don't know how desperately tangled this code has become. Why, if we touch even a line of this code, all hell could break loose. No, it's going to be months. You've all been there. You know exactly what I'm talking about. As time goes on, everything slows down because the code has gotten messier and messier 
and messier, and no one can predict what even a single line modification might do to that system. That is unstable productivity. I do not expect that. I expect stable productivity. I expect you to be going as fast today as you went last year. I expect that the speed that you go at is the same as when the whole project was a green field. I do not expect that the accumulation of code will slow you down. Now, how is it that I can expect that? I expect that you will not be making a mess. <laughs> <laughs> that seems to me to be a reasonable expectation. I expect that you will not be making a mess. And of course, if you don't make a mess, why then you'll still be able to go fast. <laughs> I expect inexpensive adaptability. Inexpensive adaptability. What that means is this, right? When your boss comes to you and says, you know, we've got a new feature, right? Customers want this new feature. If you say to your boss, oh, my God, that new feature completely thwarts our whole architecture. Well, then you have, you have created expensive adaptability. And by the way, your architecture sucks <laughs> because the whole point of software is to be adaptable. You see, software is actually two words, soft and where. <laughs> soft means soft, flexible, and where means product, flexible product. The whole point of software is to have a flexible product. The whole point of software is inexpensive adaptability. And to the extent that you make software hard to change, you have thwarted the reason that software exists. Software is there to be easy to change. So I expect inexpensive adaptability. I expect continuous improvement. Continuous improvement. Sounds reasonable, doesn't it? I mean, everything should be getting better with time, right? The code should be getting better. The design should be getting better. The architecture should be getting better. Everything should be getting better with time. That's not what happens in most projects, though, is it? In most projects, everything gets worse with time. That's not what humans do. Humans improve things with time. That's what our brains allow us to do. You know, that 5% difference between a chimpanzee and a human. That little 5% allows us to improve things with time. I expect that the software is going to get better and better with time. I have a rule. It's a real simple rule. It's called the Boy Scout rule. The Boy Scout rule is simply this. You will check the code in cleaner than you checked it out every time. Every time you check in code, it will be cleaner than when you checked it out every single time. <laughs> no matter what, you never make it worse. You always make it better. Before you check it in, you do some random act of kindness to the code to make it just a little bit better. And if everybody did that, just that, then the code would get better and better and better with time. The fact that our code does not get better with time must mean that we check the code in worse than when we checked it out. <laughs> yeah, let that one sink in for a while. I expect fearless competence. Fearless competence. <laughs> Let me explain that one to you. You, um, you look up on your screen and you see some code on that screen. And maybe you haven't seen this code for a while, but your first reaction is, oh my God, that's a mess. Oh God, that is terrible code. And your next thought is, oh, I should clean it. 
Because after all, you are an honorable person. And you look at the code and you think, man, I should clean that code because that code is a mess. But then the third thought occurs to you. I'm not touching it. Not me, man, because I, uh, if I touch it, I'll break it. And you know that if you break it, it will become yours forever. And so you back away. Not me, man. Not me. I'm not going to be the one to touch that code. No, no. Someone, someone else can clean that code, but it won't be me. That is fearful incompetence. <laughs> fearful because, of course, you are afraid. <clears throat> incompetence because you are not competent enough to clean the code <laughs> because of the fear. <laughs> Fearful incompetence. I don't expect that. I expect fearless competence. Now, how do we get that? <clears throat> We're going to have to do something that breaks the fear. Something that prevents us from being afraid. And what might that be? What could stop us? from fearing the changes that we make to the code. <laughs> Many of you out there know what I'm going to say. <laughs> you, you do write tests, don't you? I mean, as programmers, you do write unit tests, uh, tests that test the code that you wrote, right? You do do that, right? And, and hopefully you write uh, enough tests so that when your tests pass, you know the whole system works. <laughs> and hopefully those tests execute very rapidly. There is a discipline called test-driven development. Uh, I, I'm sure that some of you have heard of it in the past. Uh, I will now describe it for you because it's worthwhile knowing what this discipline is. Uh, the discipline allows us to be fearlessly competent. <laughs> if you follow this discipline, and if you follow it well, you will be fearless and competent. <laughs> so how does the discipline work? Well, you see, there are three rules to test-driven development. And these three rules you will not like because they sound ridiculous. The first rule is that you will not write a line of production code until you have first written a test that fails. And that test must fail because of the line that you have not yet written. <laughs> now, right away, that's a little bit strange, right? You've got to write a test. And you've got to write a test that fails because of what you have not yet written in the production code. <laughs> And by the way, um, that means that the very first code you write will be test code. And that rule will continue throughout the rest of this discussion. Now, right away, you ask the question, how the heck am I going to test something that's not written yet? I mean, I haven't written the code. How do you test code that's not written yet? Well, never mind that, because the next rule is much worse. <laughs> the next rule is, you are not allowed to write more of a test than is sufficient to fail. You can't write like a whole bunch of tests. You've got to write just enough of a test so that that test fails. And by the way, failing to compile is failing. So you cannot write more of a test that will, once it, once it fails to compile, you must stop writing it and start writing production code again. Now, if you think about that for any length of time, you will realize that this will trap you in a loop that is, oh, five seconds long. You'll have to write a line of test code and go, oh my God, that doesn't compile. And then you'll write a line of production code. Oh my God, that makes it compile. And you'll have to stop and go back to the production, the test code. Oh, I, I'm gonna write another line that doesn't compile. And this is when the third law kicks in. The third law is the worst of them all. The third law says you are not allowed to write more production code than is sufficient to pass the currently failing test. So now you are locked in this five-second loop. There's no way out of it. 
you are going to go around and around this five second little loop, writing a line of test code, and it doesn't compile. Write a line of production code, well, that makes it compile. Write another line of test code, uh, it still doesn't compile. Write another line of production code, oh, I made it compile too. Write another line of test code, well, it compiles, but it doesn't work. Write a line of production code, well, I made it work. That's your life. That's gonna be your life now for the rest of time. That's what you're going to be doing. And if you're a programmer of any year's experience, you think about that and go, well, <laughs> I'm not doing that. I mean, that would just be dumb. I mean, I'd never be able to write an if statement without interrupting myself. I'd never be able to write a while loop without interrupting myself. I'm constantly going back and forth between these two streams of code. That's just boring. It's tedious. It's stupid. It would be slow. I'm not doing it. Now, you're right about um, the fact that it's boring and tedious and slow. <laughs> <laughs> it is, because it, it, it slows you down. Definitely does. It slows you down. Yep. Because you're going back and forth between these two streams of code. It definitely slows something down. There are other things that it does not slow down. Let's talk about those things. Imagine, for example, that you are in a room with a whole bunch of other people and you're all doing this discipline, this test-driven development discipline, right? You're all in there doing this discipline pick one of you. It doesn't matter who you pick and it doesn't matter when you pick them. Everything that person was working on executed and passed its test within the last minute. A minute ago, everything was working. And it doesn't matter who you pick and it doesn't matter when you pick them. A minute ago, everything was working. How much debugging do you think you would do if everything worked a minute ago? And the answer to that is, well, there's just not a lot of debugging to do if everything worked a minute ago. <laughs> How many of you are good at the debugger? How many of you know the debugger? You've got the debug foo in your fingers. You know all the hotkeys. You know how to break point and checkpoint, and you know how to single step and step into and step over, and you can do all those wonderful debugging things. <laughs> this is not a skill to be desired. You don't want to be good at the debugger. <laughs> you only get good at the debugger by spending a lot of time debugging. I don't want you spending a lot of time debugging. For you, I want the debugger to be an occasional tool, something that you use, oh, maybe for 10 minutes every week. I don't want the hotkeys in your fingers. I want you staring at the screen going, what is that icon? Is that icon a step into or a step over? I don't want the tool to be familiar to you. Now, I could tell you that by following these three laws, you could eliminate your debug time by a substantial amount. I don't know what the amount is. Name some number. I don't care. Uh, we're going to bypass that. Just keep in mind that, you know, your debug time, if you follow these three rules, your debug time just drops off the end of the planet. Uh, that's not to say that there isn't some debugging. Yes, I still use a debugger from time to time, of course. Right? And, and you know, every once in a while, there's even a really hard debugging problem because this is still software and weird things still happen. But, but boy, oh boy, you know, the amount of time I spend debugging is tiny compared to what it used to be before I followed this discipline. But we should move on. How many of you have integrated a third-party package. And that would be most of you, I'm sure, because that's what we do nowadays. And you download this package off the internet, probably, and it's in a zip file of some kind, and you unzip it, and uh, there's some code in there, maybe some source code, maybe some, some DLLs or JAR files or whatever. But there's also a PDF, isn't there? Right? There's some PDF, and this is written by some guy who is describing how you're supposed to integrate this third-party package. And if you go to the end, of that PDF, the very last few pages of that PDF, you will find all the code examples for how to integrate this system into yours, right? Now, where's the first place you go? As a programmer, where's the first place you go in that PDF document? You go right to the end because you want to read the code examples because you're a programmer. You don't want to read what some dude wrote. You know, you want the code. You want to see the code. The code will tell you how to integrate this package. When you follow these three laws, what you are writing are the code examples for the whole system. 
You want to know how to create an object in this system? There are tests that create that object every way it can be created. You want to know how to call a certain API function in this system? There are tests that call that API function every way it can be called, throwing every exception it can throw. <laughs> those tests, those tests that you write when you follow those three laws are little documents, little documents that describe how the system works at its lowest and most detailed level. And those documents are completely unambiguous. They are written in a language that you understand intimately. They are so formal that they execute and they cannot get out of sync with the application. They are the perfect kind of low-level documentation. They are code. <laughs> <laughs> the perfect kind of low-level documentation. They're not high-level documentation. They don't give you intent, but boy, at the low level, they tell you everything you need to know. So if you follow these three laws, you will, you will vastly reduce your debug time, and you will gain a set of almost perfect documents that describe the system at its lowest levels. How much do you think that's going to speed everybody up? Well, don't answer yet, because <laughs> there's another thing we have to talk about. I'm sure that many of you over the last few years have written unit tests after the fact. <laughs> you wrote the code first, and then you wrote the unit tests. Right? Now, how much fun is that? And the answer to that is it's not much fun at all. In fact, it's kind of boring. And why is it boring? Well, you already know it works because you tested it manually. <laughs> so now at the very end, you're going to write the unit test. And it's a stupid thing to do because you already know it works. But some process weenie told you you had to. So out of guilt, you write some unit tests. And the first one you write is obvious. And it passes. You knew it would. And you write the next one. It passes too. And you knew it would. But inevitably, you will come to the function that's hard to test. It's hard to test because it got coupled in with some other functions. You didn't manage the dependencies very well. You weren't thinking about testing at the time you wrote the code. And so you wrote the code in a kind of coupled way that makes it hard to test. And in order to test it now, you're going to have to break that coupling. And you don't want to take the time to put some interfaces in and turn the dependencies around. You don't have time for that because you've already spent enough time on this and you've tested it manually. You know it works. And so you walk away and you leave a hole in the test suite. And you know that if you're leaving holes in the test suite, everybody else is too. So you know that the test suite is full of holes. <laughs> now, what is the symptom? of a test suite that's full of holes? The symptom is that when it passes, you all laugh at it. <laughs> yeah, it passed. Yeah, it passes all the time. Doesn't mean anything. Doesn't mean the system works. <laughs> it just passes. Yeah, we like to look at it when it passes. Yeah, oh, look, the light's green. Great, wonderful. Hmm. A uh, suite of tests that does not allow you to make a decision when it passes is a worthless suite of tests. It's not letting you make a decision. And what decision do you want to make when the suite of tests passes? You want it to be the deploy decision or something very close to the deploy decision. You want to say, okay, the tests pass. We can move this software to a state closer to deployment. Now, when I do this, I move it to deployment. I want the, the tests passing to be the last gate before I deploy. That's what I want. Think of, think of how that would be empowering. All you have to do is run the tests. And if the tests pass, deploy. They better be damn good tests, though, huh? <laughs> yeah, they better be damn good tests. Now, imagine you had a suite of tests like that. Imagine you had a suite of tests like that. They're so good that when they pass, you can deploy. Now bring that code up on your screen, the code that scared you so much, the code that was so awful you thought, man, I should clean this, but I'm too terrified to clean it. You are not terrified anymore, are you? You look at that code and go, oh, huh, I should clean that code. 
And, and let, let me change the name of that variable. Uh, good. Push the button. Oh, yeah, it's still green. Great. Okay. Uh, that function's too big. Let's just put that that function in half. Make it two functions. Push the button. Mm. Ah, still green. Great. Everything still works. Ooh, look, this new function that I created, that could go over in that class over there. Push the button. Ooh, red. Ooh, put it back. Put it back. Put it back. Push the button. Ah, green. Green. Oh, I see what I did wrong. It should have been in that class over there. Push the button. Ah, it's green. That is fearless competence. <laughs> the power to manipulate the code any way you want because you have that suite of tests. Something else happens when you, uh, when you uh, write those tests first. First of all, it's just a little bit of fun. It's not crazy fun. You know, it's not like party animal kind of fun. But it's a little bit of fun because when you follow the three rules, you are first making a test fail, <laughs> and then you're getting it to work. And there's always a little something about getting it to work. You remember the first the first time you got something to work? You know, you probably were barely 20-something. Maybe you were even in your teens. And the very first time you got a little few lines of code to work, and you went, oh, my God. Oh, my God. I am a God. <laughs> you remember. Well, a little bit of that is left. And every time you get the test to pass, it's like, oh, yeah, I remember what it's like to be a programmer that actually gets things to work. But something else happens as well. It is impossible to write the code that's hard to test if you write the test first. <laughs> the code you write will be testable because you wrote the test first. Writing the test first forces you to decouple the production code into testable units. And that decoupling means that the design of the production code is going to be better. These three laws are pretty powerful. Right? They, they, they can drastically reduce your debug time. They can give you this stream of documentation that will help everybody for years. They are a little bit of fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they help you with the design and they eliminate the fear that drives the fearful incompetence that so many of us live with even today. <laughs> and because you are now doing test-driven development, I expect extreme quality. You've got a suite of tests that passes. I don't expect an awful lot of bugs coming out of this software. I expect extreme quality. Like, you know, zero bugs or really close to zero bugs. I mean, when the customers report a defect, all of you should be going, what? How the hell did that happen? How could we possibly have shipped the defect? Look at our test suite. How could we? It should be a remarkable event that a customer finds a defect. And because of that, I expect that we will not dump on QA. You guys have all got QA departments, I'm sure. You've got a bunch of guys out there who test your code for you. Now, I want you to think about just how weird that is, that you've got a bunch of guys who test your code for you. Don't you think you ought to be testing your code yourself? But never mind that. <laughs> I expect that we will not be dumping on QA. What is dumping on QA? Dumping us on QA is when, in order to meet a deadline... You send code to QA that you know is defective. <laughs> you all do it. Right? You all do it. You know you do. I don't expect that. In fact, I expect QA will find nothing. Oh, you can still hand it over to QA. And QA will run their tests. I expect them to find nothing. QA should find nothing. Now, maybe from time to time they will. But if they do, you should all be up in arms and say, well, how the hell did that happen? Those guys should find nothing. In fact, I don't even want QA to be at the end of the process anymore. I want them to feel useless at the end of the process. I want QA moved to the beginning of the process. I want QA to be writing the tests, not executing the tests. I want the tests executed 
automatically. Yes, automation. I want test automation. I want all the tests automated. The picture you're looking at right now, the hands you see are the hands of a QA manager holding out to me the table of contents for his manual test plan. That's right, that document that you see, that big, massive, thick document held in place with three alligator binding clips is just the table of contents for his manual test plan. He has 80,000 manual tests that he must run once every six months. He sends that battery of tests to an army of people in India somewhere, and it costs him a million dollars every time he does it. He's holding it out to me because he's just gotten back from his boss's office. The year is 2008. The financial crisis has begun, and he's just been told that his budget's getting cut by 50%. So he's holding this out to me, and he's asking me which half of these tests he shouldn't run. And I told him, well, you can cut the document lengthwise or breadthwise or depthwise. It doesn't matter. You're not going to know if half your system works. This is the inevitable result of manual testing. Manual testing is insane. Manual testing is morally depraved. Manual testing means that you will lose those tests. You'll lose them the way this poor guy did. You know, eventually the accountants just said, well, that's too expensive. We can't have, you know, an army of people in India every six months. We can't do that. That's how you might lose the test. But there's a much more insidious way that you will more likely lose the tests. And that insidious way comes about because the software developers usually don't deliver on time. You know, towards the end of a release, you know, it's about time to release something. And, you know, the QA people, they've blocked out this time for testing. And it depends on the developers actually, you know, giving them the code at the right time. But the developers don't because developers are always late. And that means that QA uh, has less time to do their tests. Now, you might think that maybe you'd postpone the ship date. No, we don't do that, do we? No, we just squeeze QA. So now QA is in this in in unenviable position. You know, they have to execute their entire battery of tests in half the allotted time, which of course they cannot do. And then therefore the QA people start to choose which tests they'll run. <laughs> they try to do it intelligently. They do impact analysis. They look at what features change and they, well, that feature didn't change, so we probably don't need to test that one. <laughs> and you lose the tests that way. One way or the other, if you're doing manual testing, you will lose those tests. And that gives us about 10 minutes for Q&A. So I am going to put my contact information up on the screen. You want to contact me, you can contact me at those addresses. That's my email address. Those are my two websites. Cleancoder.com is where you can find out what the events are going to be. Like this event is on, on cleancoders.com. Cleancoder Cleancoders.com is where I sell videos. <laughs> lots and lots of lessons about software in video format. Uh, and if you've never seen any of those, um, well, let's just say they're a little bit different, <laughs> but full of content. And with that, I open the floor for questions. Fire away, gentlemen and ladies. Okay, there are two questions. First is from Jacek. How explicit about those things we should be? Uh, about professionalism, uh, my guess would be we, sh we should never talk about professionalism itself with our managers. We should just do that without mentioning the word. Oh, I completely agree with that. You don't want to go, you know, stomping around the office saying, we have to be professionals and, you know, tell your manager that. Uh, and, and, and you must never, ever ask for permission to be professionals. <laughs> Don't go to your boss and say, is it okay if we behave professionally? 
do not ask for permission to write tests. Do not ask for permission to clean the code. Do not ask for permission to do the things you know you must do. You behave professionally because professionalism is inside of you. You were actually hired to be a professional. Your company expected that you would be a professional. And a professional knows how to behave. Never ask for permission to do the things you know you must do. If you know you must write tests, you simply write tests. If your boss comes to you and says, how could you go faster? If like, if you didn't write tests, could you go faster? You don't even answer that question. You just say, we write tests. And, and by the way, that is the, that is the way we go fastest. We go fastest when we write tests. So don't even mention the idea that we're not going to write tests. Never go to your boss and say, we need three weeks to clean everything up. That's a terrible thing to do. Don't, don't ever do that. Just clean it up. And by the way, don't spend three weeks cleaning it up. Figure you're going to be cleaning it up over a period of many, many months. In fact, you will never stop cleaning it up. It will just be part of what you always do. That is one of the things that you will profess as a profession. <laughs> you know, you were hired to be a professional. And you know what the most valuable thing a professional can say to a, to a, a manager? You know what that is? It's the word no. When a manager comes to you or an executive or a customer and they say, we need to do this and it's got to be done by September 1st, you can go away for a little while and do the math. And if there's no way this is going to be done by September 1st, that then you go back to that person and you say, no. Now, you don't do it in a dumb way. You don't say, no. Not going to do it. No. But you make sure they understand. Nope. This can't be done by September 1st. You're going to have to figure out something else because this cannot be done by September 1st. The most, prof the most valuable thing a professional can do is keep their employer from destroying themselves by overcommitting and, you know, fooling themselves that they can do something that cannot be done. As a professional, there are several things you need to watch out for. We programmers, we did not get into this business because we like people. You know, we like things. We like computers. We like staring at code for hours and hours. We like to focus deep on intellectual problems. And I'm generalizing, of course, but in general... We programmers, we don't like the people side of things all that much. We, we'd rather just write code. It's not to say that we're antisocial. It's just, you know, between people and code, we go for the code. Managers don't do that, at least good managers. Good managers have the opposite action. They like the people challenge. They really like it. They, they like dealing with people. They view people the way we view code. <laughs> now, what does that mean? It means that the way that managers get to the truth is very different from the way you and I get to the truth. You and I, we programmers, we get to the truth mathematically, logically. We see the code. We test the code. It works. It's a binary result. True or false. That's how we deal with truth. Managers do it in a very different way. They do it with people. And when you're doing it with people, it's about emotion. A manager will get to the truth by stressing your emotion. They will put pressure on you. They will challenge you. They will push at you and prod at you. And they will watch the way you react emotionally. Now, let's say that a manager comes to you and says, we need this by next Tuesday. And you realize that's impossible. 
You say, I'm sorry, that can't be done by next Tuesday. The manager will then come to you and say, you're not being a team player. You don't understand how important this is. You need to do what it takes, whatever it takes to get it done by Tuesday. The manager has now put you in the position of not being a team player, of not behaving properly. And you have to parse that in your brain and go, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is just emotional manipulation. And you need to go back to the manager and say, manager, I'm sorry. We are behaving as best as we can, as best as we know how. We are, try we are trying as hard as we can. This is not possible. It's not possible. I'm sorry. It's not possible. And then... And the manager will pull out the last little trick. And you got to watch out for this trick. Right? Will you at least try? Now, it seems so obvious that you should say, well, yes, of course, I'll try. But you must not, because that's a lie. <laughs> You're not going to try. There, you've already decided it can't be done. There's no magic beans you're going to pull out of your pocket to change reality and actually get it done. You aren't actually going to be changing your behavior in any way. In fact, what you are doing when you say, of course, I'll try. What you are doing really is you are just trying to get rid of him or her. You're trying to get rid of that manager. You're trying to end the conversation because it's uncomfortable. And so it's a lie. You must not say that you will try. You must say instead, we are already trying. We are already trying as hard as we can. We cannot try any harder. This is not going to happen. <laughs> that was a long discussion on a short question, but thank you for asking it. Last question. If there's more, maybe we can do more. Uh, okay, there is a question. Uh, so it's the writing unit test after, is that really bad? Even if we do it properly, like positive, negative scenario, uh, hide coverage, fixing some bugs right away after test. The discussion of whether it's bad to write tests after the fact is not quite the right question. It is not bad to write tests after the fact. So long as you can get the coverage. So long as you do test everything. <laughs> now, my, my experience has been that if you write tests after the fact, you will leave holes in the test suite. It's just the way that seems to work. It's a, some kind of human nature. So I like to invert that and write the tests first. I like to follow test-driven development so that there is no chance that I can leave a hole in the test suite. There is, however, another discipline. And this discipline was created by the same person who created the test-driven development discipline. And let me see if I can remember the name of this discipline. It's, it's called um, um, Code Test Revert, I think it is, CTR or something like that. And you can look this up. Look up Kent. Kent Beck and um, Code Test Revert or something like that. And the way it works is this. You do write your production code first, and then you write a test right afterwards. However, you have a script that is running automatically. And as soon as you save the test code, it runs the test code. And if the test fails, it does a git reset hard. It erases everything you wrote bef between then and the last time the test passed. <laughs> so if you write a failing test, you lose everything. Now, that, of course, drives you to work in very tiny increments that you are absolutely sure will work. Now, by the way, test-driven development does the exact same thing. It forces you to work in very tiny increments that you're sure will work very close to sure you will work. So the end result of these two disciplines is the same. However, test-driven development writes the tests first and, you know, code test revert writes the test last. <laughs> you see the interesting discipline involved is what really matters. All right. 
It is, uh, oh, we got about one minute left if there's another question. And if there's not, then I think we are done. Uh, yeah, I think there is no questions. So, yes, uh, thank you for coming to the Jack. Thank you for, in this hard time, to being with us and uh, provide some content for people to, you know, feel good in home. Uh, I hope that for m maybe in next year, maybe in the next few years, when everything will just calm down, you will come to the Wrocław. And if you have so many good thoughts about that, so that would be great to have you here uh, personally you. and meet. Uh, so, yes, uh, thank you, you all, for coming. There is a lot of people here. And thank you for those discussions in the comments. A lot of people talking and, and discussing about many things which you were, were talking about. So yeah, this topic is uh, important for us, for the community. Thank you. Very welcome. Thank you for having me.